So Dr. Chris Harley has been on the faculty at UBC since 2005. He is currently joint appointed in the Department of Zoology and the Institute for Oceans and Fisheries. Chris completed his PhD at the University of Washington in 2001. He spent several years as a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University and the University of California, Davis. He supervises several grad students, a postdoctoral fellow, and some undergrad honor students. So you can imagine he's got quite a bit on his plate besides his own research. This is actually Dr. Harley's second presentation to us. Exactly nine years ago, or pretty much exactly, on March 14th, 2013, he presented for the marine biology section on climate uh, change effects on the intertidal zone. We were forewarned. And uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to him with what will have to be like the best titled uh, presentation of our season. Over to you, Chris. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, it is delightful to be back with this group. Um, and I do recognize a few names and faces, which is very, very nice. Um, so it's not especially hot right now, uh, but you may remember back to uh, June of, of last summer uh, where we had that really incredible three days of high temperatures in the province and, and broke all those records. And I'm gonna talk about the consequences of that um, on our um, intertidal shores in British Columbia. And this is a, a photo of nary a living mussel uh, taken in, near Lighthouse Park over in West Vancouver. Uh, and you can see them just gaping open. This was uh, taken on the, the third of those three hot days. But before I get to uh, some of that, uh, oh, and, and uh, incidentally, the, the well that stunk does refer to the uh, very noticeable aroma that accompanied the, the die-offs on, on the shore. But before talking about that, um, uh, uh, and as alluded to uh, uh, moments ago, we have known that the climate is changing for a long time. Uh, so in some ways, this was not a surprise that something like this uh, could happen. So I'll, I'll start sort of um, uh, with where I would normally try to end, which is thanking people. And that's because I get a little bit too wound up and excited about the, the, the science and then forget to flip to the last slide where I acknowledge the, uh, the many really fun and talented and devoted students who've worked in my lab. Um, grad students in the upper two photos, um, last year's um, summer undergraduate photos in, the, in that bottom left one with, with the Lionsgate Bridge in the background. Uh, and my family in the right, that photo is old enough that I still had my COVID beard um, uh, they, uh, join me in the intertidal often and are very permissive of me disappearing, you know, around the new moons and full moons when the, the low tides are uh, at their lowest. So with acknowledgements that, uh, uh, the things that I am going to describe here, uh, have really been the work of a large team. Um, uh, I, I thank them, uh, for all of their, uh, good efforts. So climate change is one of the things that my students and I spend a lot of time thinking about, worrying about, trying to predict. And um, you have, if you're attending this talk, likely given this topic uh, some thought, but, but I have some sort of general ideas about why I'm concerned about climate change. Uh, and that's because it affects some of the things we really care about. So uh, the a uh, strange uh, shaped thing here is a, a northern or pinto abalone, which used to be a commercially important um, uh, species in British Columbia until it was over harvested and now it is endangered. Uh, it uh, has been and uh, continues to be uh, culturally important to indigenous peoples. Um, the spiny red thing in the bottom left is a sea urchin. That's another commercially valuable um, uh, shellfish. And uh, these species are vulnerable to changes in the environment ranging from uh, uh, warmer temperatures to ocean acidification. So those are sort of individual species uh, in, you know, that are valuable in some way uh, because we care about them for themselves. 
There's also species that do us some great favors, things like the kelps and the seagrasses, which uh, provide habitat for a lot of other things. They uh, can reduce rates of coastal erosion. There's a lot of services provided for species like that, and we know that they are vulnerable to environmental change. Um, and then there's just biodiversity as a whole. And I can, and in fact will, give you reasons why we should conserve biodiversity uh, as, a, as a way to fight climate change. Um, but I can also just as a human, not as a scientist, say I love photos like that that just show the wonderful things you can find in the tide pool out on the outer coast. And if we can keep those things around, then let's try to do that. And climate change is, is definitely reducing diversity in our ecosystems, and that's something to, to be concerned about. All right, now I work on rocky shorelines in places like this. This is actually Tatoosh Island in northwestern Washington state. Uh, but I like this photo because it shows one of the really striking characteristics of a rocky shore um, in, in this part of the world, and that is the zonation patterns. So uh, up high on the shore where you're out of the water most of the time, this is where a lot of the barnacles live. And then there's a zone of red algae. And then the gray here is all mussel bed. And then below that, there's a zone of kelps. And then that bottom green ring is surf grass. And that sort of layer cake pattern, um, it, it, you, you see that uh, quite often. And it's instructive because the upper limits of a lot of these things are related to their tolerance of stress. So the mussels don't live any higher because they would be out of the water for too long and they would risk getting too hot or drying out too much uh, and they would die. And then the mussels don't live uh, any lower than they do because of interactions with other species. Uh, in the case of the mussels, there are plenty of sea stars lower on the shore that would happily eat them um, if they had uh, chosen to settle you know, that low um, as they were uh, coming out of the, the plankton as larvae. And because we have that sort of interplay of, of stresses, we can sort of uh, understand, uh, whoops, um, you know, if you see a change in how the this zonation pattern looks, you know, from place to place or through time, you can, you know, start to say, well, all right, if it was an upper limit change, the environment has probably done it. Um, if it's a lower limit change, maybe it's a change in the interactions with with other species. And uh, we've learned a great deal about that um, in the the Salish Sea and on the outer coast of, of Vancouver Island. And uh, some of this uh, is work that follows up on a master's thesis done in the late 1950s by a, uh, at the time, UBC botany student named Tom Widdowson. And he, we know that since Widdowson did his surveys in the 50s, that it's gotten a, a fair amount warmer. These are the summer average daily um, maximum air temperatures uh, for Victoria. Uh, and uh, in the course of doing this field work, and I, I did it in 2009, 2010, which is why the, this data set ends uh, in 2010. Um, even then, uh, the, the motel where I was staying was uncomfortably hot, and I had to sleep with the door open. And I you know, mentioned that to the, the very nice clerk uh, when checking out. And she said, oh, man, yeah, when this place was built in the 50s, we never needed uh, to cool the rooms down. So there's no air conditioning. It's never been installed. I'm like, huh, interesting how that happens. Um, so it's gotten warmer in, the, uh, in our province. Um, and the uh, distribution of things on the shore has changed. Um, so uh, the photo on the right shows uh, what sort of a, a, a typical shoreline on the south coast of Vancouver Island looks like. This is um, uh, at Point No Point, which is one of my favorite place names uh, in the region. And uh, so there's the barnacle zone you can see high up here, and there's an upper limit to where those barnacles live. Um, then the, just below them is, is the mussel bed, which has an upper limit and a lower limit. And when Tom Widowson did his surveys in the late 50s, this is the position of those species limits. And when I resurveyed these shores um, 50, 52 years later, those upper limits of barnacles and mussels have come down the shore. Um, that is very likely because it is hotter now than it used to be, and they can't be out of the water for as long, or they would um, basically overheat and die. But interestingly and importantly, that lower limit hasn't changed. If anything, it's crept up the shore a tiny amount. 
Um, the reason for that is that sea stars, these predatory pisaster, they didn't care that it got warmer at low tide. They're actually pretty good at finding nice, cool, shady spots to hang out when the tide is low. And when the tide is high, they run around and eat every muscle that they can, they can uh, get to. And this is a picture of them doing exactly that, or at least in the process of doing that. Um, and so because the, those predators are still doing their thing down low, but it's now too hot to live up high, we've had this squeeze through time. Uh, and that's resulted in a loss of, of just over 50% of the vertical range of the muscle bed. So in half a century, we've lost half of the muscle bed. And that's habitat for um, quite literally hundreds of other little species that use the, the space that mussels provide uh, as cool, moist places. And, and a lot of things eat mussels as well. And of the 14 sites where Widowson visited and found mussels back in the 50s, uh, there are only mussels at 11 of those sites uh, on my revisit. So there have been some local extinctions where that squeeze has been complete. Okay, that was uh, a sobering thing to observe. Uh, but one of the you know, challenges of this type of resurvey is we don't have any information about what was happening between Widowson surveys and mine. Uh, so has this just been a gradual creep and every year things are a half centimeter you know, further down the shore? Or have there been some sudden sharp shocks um, which in some ways are more worrying because they're more difficult to, to predict. Um, but we have another data set that we can bring to bear on this. Um, and that is on the upper limit of this algal turf. So this sort of golden green um, uh, seaweed here is named Maziella. And uh, this photo with, with a, a researcher for scale shows uh, this upper limit that looks sort of like snow, that is Maziello that has bleached because uh, a, a low tide uh, was very hot and sunny and the little fronds of this alga uh, don't deal very well with that. And so when it gets really hot, uh, the fronds die. Um, when it gets exceptionally hot, then the basal system also dies. And the upper limit of the species is nice because it's, it's uh, fairly discreet and you can measure it. And uh, this is where I was able to take advantage of a data set collected by Bob Payne, uh, who was my PhD supervisor, who'd been working um, in the Pacific Northwest since the 60s and had been collecting these data since the late 70s. Uh, so that's Bob on the left um, in the orange pants, and that's me on the right in the yellow pants. And this was in his later years where he would send me down to the you know, slippery slope of doom, where if I fell off, I was real in trouble and would have to dodge the wave. So doing field work with Bob involved a, a lot of this. Um, and uh, the long-term patterns he documented were remarkable in a, in, a, in a couple of ways. And the first thing that really just boggled my mind was the first 15 years that he collected this data, it was just completely uninteresting. There was no change in where you could find this seaweed, but he still did it. He still measured the distance from his little permanent bolts down to the upper limit of this thing um, every two weeks in the summertime and then whenever he was able to in the winter. And then finally in the 1990s, something happened and the whole thing shifted down to a lower position on the shore. And uh, this is, uh, you know, the, the mid 90s is about when, when I got involved in this as, as I started uh, as a student in his lab and began working on the species. And so he sort of just handed me this data set and said, go. And um, one can dig through the environmental records. And because the frequency with which he was collecting data was so fine, you could identify particular weather events associated with these drops in the upper limits. Um, so the time series for which uh, data existed is sort of from the um, early 80s onwards. The, the lighthouse on the island uh, collects air temperature data and there's um, uh, sunshine and wave data from nearby. And the first really unusual hot day that coincided with calm seas was in 1993 where we have this first drop, but then it recovers the basal system hadn't been killed. 1994, there was another very hot um, um, day. And again, it dropped, uh, but again, it recovered because the basal system hadn't been killed. And in 1995 was the hottest of the three summers. And that was finally enough 
to reset the system down to a position lower on the shore. Now, uh, this is uh, only about 10 vertical centimeters, but remember this is on a sloping shore, so it's actually moving quite a distance. You know, you're losing a, a, a pretty substantial amount of, of this habitat. Uh, and then we had another big heat wave in 2004, or, or, uh, or maybe it was five, I think in 2004, uh, and it happened again. And so, uh, you know, what we don't know from the Widowson data, we down, now do know for this species, which is these changes occur in these discrete steps, at least for, for this alga. Um, and that is challenging to predict because if Bob had just stopped after 14 years of collecting this data, we would say this stuff never changes. Uh, it's fine. Uh, but clearly it is not. Okay. So all of that is to say that climate change is well underway. All right. It's, it's definitely warmer than it was when we were kids. Um, uh, it, it always frustrates me a little bit when the media talks about climate change as this is the problem that our children are going to have to deal with. Um, they could have been saying that to our parents and to our grandparents about their children. Uh, we are already living in the future from the perspective of someone in the 1950s or even someone in the 1990s. All right, so we know things are changing. We would like to understand uh, how and uh, what those patterns will be so we can anticipate, so we can plan, so we can say, all right, maybe we should not try to invest too much in aquaculture of this species, but look at this species, or maybe we need to uh, think harder about catch limits for salmon. I mean, the, the, there's all sorts of things where ecology plays in uh, to how we uh, manage and conserve nature. Uh, and so understanding uh, climate change uh, plays into all of that as well. All right, so we have tried a number of ways to actually simulate the future in the field. And so I'll show you a few examples which, which are fun. Uh, this is Amelia Hesketh, who's just about to finish her PhD in my lab. And she has a series of tiles that are bordered with either white um, uh, plates or black. And the black ones heat up more in the sun. So uh, as long as the sun is shining, she can simulate the future by having these little black um, bordered, uh, you know, miniature ecosystems and comparing them to the, to the white ones. And so we've learned a bunch of useful things from that. Um, one that I really like uh, is <laughs> initially developed by uh, Graham Brownlee and Cassandra Konechny, who's shown here laughing maniacally because they figured out how to adapt a propane powered turkey fryer into a heat exchange system to heat up tide pools to simulate the, the future for, for tide pool ecosystems. And that worked uh, really, really well. And they, they named this system um, the Seaside Array for Understanding Thermal Effects or SAUTE. So uh, that paper just came out uh, uh, a few months ago if you want to read all about it. Um, uh, and then uh, another one of my PhD students, Sandra Emery, uh, has taken these propane camp heaters and hung them upside down from these PVC frames to heat up areas where uh, she's transplanted this seaweed. And, and this was an experiment to look at the effects of um, local adaptation to different thermal environments. And, and I, I put this one third because she uh, has two very young children um, uh, has had a lot of, of just sort of logistical challenges getting this work done and had sunk a huge amount of time into repeating this experiment for a second time last summer and was attempting to raise the temperature in this um, rockweed bed by uh, about four degrees and her scheduled day to do, and it came in two installments. There was like the early heat wave and the late one. And the scheduled day for the late heat wave was June 28th, which happened to be the hottest day of the heat wave where the actual temperatures on the rock were many, many degrees hotter than what she was using as the, what she was trying to simulate. So it, it really changed the nature of her experiment. So this is what that, the, the heat dome looked like. Um, uh, the scale bar on the right shows you deviation from sort of normal um, in degrees C. And uh, this is a, a computer modeled uh, projection. And if you're wondering about the tropicaltidbits.com, which sounds like a totally made up website, um, this is actually the climatological experts that predict um, the, the formation and tracks of tropical storms uh, and hurricanes, uh, thus the tropical tidbits. But anyway, they did this for the heat dome and 
getting deviations up into the 20s is absurd. Um, Lytton, as you probably know, broke the all-time Canadian high temperature on Saturday the 26th and then broke it again on the 27th and then broke it again on the 28th and then burned down on the 29th. It's the kind of thing where if you had written it in an, you know, an apocalyptic movie script, people would be like, yeah, all right. So I mean, it was really bad. And breaking a national temperature record by almost five degrees is unheard of. You normally break those by fractions of degrees because think of how many years and how many sites we have temperature data for in Canada to, to hit temperatures that extreme was, was uh, really, really unusual. Okay, um, if you lived in Vancouver, it was definitely hot here. Uh, so the, the red trace just compares 2021 to the previous two years. And you can see, you know, all right, it was a sort of a few degrees warmer. Uh, but it turns out the Vancouver data were collected at the airport. Uh, and the airport gets a, a bit of a sea breeze uh, flown in across the strait. So, so Vancouver kind of underestimates uh, well, at least the Vancouver airport underestimates how warm it got, even in, in places like Port Moody, which are not very far from the airport, but especially places like Campbell River, uh, where you can really see that spike of the, the heat dome in 2021, where that's, you know, a good seven degrees or so warmer than anything in the, the past few years. So um, suffice it to say, this was a really extreme event. And it coincided with really low tides. Uh, these were some of the lowest tides of the summer. Uh, and I'm just showing you tidal data from um, three sites, one up on Calvert Island, where the Hakai Institute has a field station, uh, Vancouver, and then uh, this one, Nia Bay, is, is close to places like Banfield and Tofino uh, and Tatouche Island. And uh, so the, the tides are very low. This uh, is a graph that's, that's in a paper that I'm uh, co-publishing with a bunch of colleagues in the US, including uh, other academics, tribal biologists, and uh, government folks. Um, so this has been adjusted to the US chart datum where you can actually have negative tides. Um, but these are very, very low tides. And, and we've drawn in noon on each of these three uh, days of the heat, heat dome. So on the outer coast, you know, the tides are very low, but they're reasonably early in the morning or, you know, mid morning. But in places like Vancouver or Campbell River, they're smack dab in the middle of the day or early afternoon. So worst case scenario, if you're an intertidal um, um, muscle or a barnacle or something like that. And to look at the shore um, on June 28th, that hottest of days, uh, it doesn't actually look that bad. I mean, this is Lighthouse Park. This is what Lighthouse Park normally looks like. Uh, but we took a thermal imaging camera out with us. Uh, oh, right. I forgot. There's a quiz. Um, all right. I, I don't have an, uh, an official Zoom quiz set up. So you're just going to have to mentally think of what your answer here is. And then you can um, brag about being right if you were correct. Uh, so how hot do you think it actually got on the shore? And I mean, on the rocks, not air temperature. Um, uh, in Lighthouse Park during the heat dome. Uh, and I give you these options. You can take a moment, pick the one you think is most likely. And then I'll explain uh, why I chose these particular temperatures. Um, 44.1 is about the temperature that would kill most of, of the barnacles, which are the most thermally tolerant of the intertidal organisms we've got. Uh, 49.6, you might recognize as our new Canadian uh, record high temperature uh, recorded at Lytton on the day this photograph was taken. 54.0 uh, is the second hottest day ever recorded um, in terms of air temperature on Earth. And it was a, actually a tie between Death Valley and Kuwait. And then 56.7 is the hottest day on record. Um, which was uh, also Death Valley, although this, this one, um, some people think that, that value might not be accurate and that we should use 54.0 uh, instead. Uh, so uh, I'll come back to uh, which of these temperatures we got to. Okay, so here's, here's what a thermal image of the shore looks like. Um, and the temperature uh, up in the upper left is just what the sort of the bullseye target here is pointing at, which in this case is water. Uh, what you should pay attention to is the scale bar, though, which goes uh, from 18 to over 50. So some of the rocks, which are out over here, uh, are really screaming hot. 
And there were areas in the muscle bed where we recorded temperatures as high as 56.7, which coincidentally was the hottest temperature ever recorded in Death Valley. So really, really hot. Okay, so what were the consequences of getting up to, to such extreme temperatures? Well, a lot of stuff died. Uh, we found dead sea stars that had just been caught out in the sun. Um, this is uh, uh, three different animals from uh, over in, in Stanley Park, where this one had been in the shade. Presumably this one got really the sunburn of its life. And I'm not, th these were all taken a couple weeks uh, after the, the um, heat dome. I'm not sure if that animal would have, uh, you know, recovered from this or not. And then the one on the right was, was already dead. Um, we saw lots of things like kelp crabs dying. This is down at 1001 Steps, um, not far from White Rock, uh, if you're familiar with that area, where you have these low intertidal pools formed by the, the, the sandbar there and the, that shallow water where these crabs live got really, really hot and they died. Um, we lost a lot of, you know, shore crabs like this one and these whelks uh, um, died by the droves. And I've actually, uh, I have a, a little jar of those that I keep with me. Uh, uh, these are all uh, victims of the, the heat dome. Uh, and I use that to, to remind myself that I need to be <laughs> busy analyzing the data. Um, but all of those things are mobile. And the mobile animals although some of them were caught out and died, for the most part, their populations were pretty okay. Um, so yes, you could find a lot of dead snails and dead crabs, but there were also a lot of uh, animals that were able to hide under rocks or retreat into you know, deeper water uh, or the clever little sea stars here just hiding in the, in the shade where they would not have gotten so hot. So um, it wasn't a total catastrophe if you could move, but not everything can move. Um, clams, well, I guess clams can sort of try to burrow a little bit deeper, but there's limits uh, to that. And so we lost a lot of these uh, heart cockles. Um, the uh, animals on the bottom are called jingle shells, uh, which are very rare in the intertidal. <laughs> Maybe now we know why. Uh, the, the ones that I could find there in Ladysmith had all died. Um, uh, and sand dollars, they're not going anywhere very fast. They died by the thousands up on Cortez Island and in other places. Uh, and then once you start thinking about things like barnacles, uh, all of these barnacles in this photo uh, uh, probably, well, mostly are, are, uh, have died. They are just now little empty husks of their former selves. Um, mussels uh, were uh, perhaps the uh, initial poster child because it's very obvious when a mussel dies, it looks just like it does after it's been cooked and served to you in, in a restaurant. Uh, so these are our mussels uh, during the heat dome uh, with the, the meat still inside. Uh, and just a few other photos uh, of the, uh, how hot the, the muscle bed was getting. And if you look closely, you can actually see that these muscle shells are already open when they're at temperatures up into the 40s or, or above. Okay, so I can show you pictures. Uh, the one on the left is from Kitsilano, uh, looking towards downtown. The one on the, on the right is uh, Porto Cove in House Sound. Uh, but the, the pictures don't capture the, the experience of having been out on the shore um, just after this had happened. And of course, the, the smell I can't share with you and be grateful for that. Um, but the, the sound of walking across a muscle bed, um, which hopefully uh, I remember, you know, I'm going to stop share because I think I forgot to click that button where the sound comes through. So bear with me for a second. Let me reshare. Oh, it is sharing the sound. All right, fantastic. All right, so hopefully you'll hear this. If not, no worries, I'll describe it. And this is not the normal sound that a muscle bed makes when you walk across it. So this to me is very disconcerting. This is on um, Galliano. And this muscle bed, I mean, it really goes to the entire northeast shoreline of, of the island, which is uh, you know, tens and tens of kilometers long. Um, that particular area was about the size of a tennis court, and we did some quadrat-based sampling and estimated that a million mussels died in, in an area just the size of a tennis court. And once they're empty, their shells are open and, and you know, brittle, and that's the sound of, of walking across uh, uh, basically the cemetery that, that had been a mussel bed uh, prior to the, the heat dome. Um, the... Uh, 
patterns were were interesting in some in some very specific ways too. Uh, and we can think of that in so if you look at sort of the, the shoreline in uh, Lighthouse Park and the photo on the left, you know, some of some of that faces south and was in the sun in the hottest part of the day. And think, all right, that that area would have really gotten hot. And then, you know, some other parts of this face north or are even a little bit overhung uh, and may have been in the shade. And so we can look at where mussels lived and where they died and sort of put it on this axis of incoming sunlight. So uh, uh, on the far left here at 90 degrees, that would be the sort of gentle southwest facing uh, rock, uh, where if you lay down on that rock on your back and opened your eyes, you would be staring directly into the afternoon sun. Uh, and then as you move to the right on this axis, you get to angles that are, you know, uh, further around towards the north or over a little ridge. Uh, and then eventually you hit zero degrees, which is the edge of shade and anything further than that is, is fully shaded. And We've done this at a whole bunch of places um, with a whole bunch of species, but uh, mussels in Stanley Park illustrate this really well. Um, if you were a fairly large mussel in the sun uh, during the heat dome at low tide, you were in real trouble. And mortality was, was pretty close to 100%. Uh, for most of that. And then only once you were either, um, you know, right on the edge of being shaded or actually in the shade, that's where the, the muscles survived. So uh, that's, that's bad. You don't want to be, you know, low tide in the sun should not be an automatic death sentence, but uh, for some species on, on that day, it was. Um, we know that the direction, you know, you face on a rock matters, and th this is one of my favorite photos of sideways intertidal zonation from um, up near Roberts Creek on the Sunshine Coast, where the right side of the rock faces south and there's not very much growing on it. Uh, and then you get the high intertidal band of barnacles at the top and then a mix of rockweed and mussels on the left, that's the side that, that, that slopes to the north. Um, so that rock in 2021, one year later, looked very different. Um, the barnacles, the shells are still there, but they've all died. The mussels, you can actually see where they've been lost compared to where they used to live. Uh, and the rockweed um, has all died on here too. And, you know, that's one boulder that's, you know, maybe a, a meter and a bit across. But my favorite, favorite, uh, the most impactful maybe photos of, of, the, of some of these losses were, were taken of the rockweed uh, fucus. And they weren't taken by me, they were taken by an undergraduate named Lyra Calvo, who just happened to be doing a project on the importance of this species in providing shade and moisture for everything that lives under it. And she was working near Belcara. Um, and this is her site down close to Admiralty Point, if you're familiar with that area. And she picked this because it was this you know, beautiful lush bed of rockweed and she took that photo of her site um, a few weeks before the heat dome uh, and then shortly after the heat dome you can see how much has already been lost uh, but even what's remaining there uh, a lot of that has been damaged to the point where it continues to wash away so a month after the heat dome that shore is is considerably different it's just a, a sort of a barren waste uh, compared to what it had been um, just uh, uh, a, a month and, uh, and a bit earlier. Chris, we have a question in the text. Can you see it? Oh, I... I can read it. To, oh, yes, you. you could read it. I think I'd have to do yeah. some gymnastics. How did, how did the brachial pots fare? Because they're usually below low tide lines. Ooh. Yeah, brachiopods are very low on the shore. And I didn't see, well, in normal explorations of the intertidal, it's very rare that I would see them because uh, they're not especially common and you need a really good low tide to uh, access them. So excellent question. I don't know. Um, if I were to guess, I would say that this was probably no fun for them because they live in similar habitats to the jingle shells I showed earlier, which was, you know, those jingle shells were like, in deeply shaded areas underneath of very large boulders um, uh, where I sort of had to clamber down in to, and hold my phone underneath to get the, to get the photo because I could get my arm in there, but not my head. That would be brachiopod habitat and it clearly got hot enough to kill other things. So uh, who knows, um, could have been bad for brachiopods. But again, there's lots of subtitle brachiopods as well. And although water temperatures did get a little warmer during the heat do dome, uh, it wasn't catastrophically warm. So the subtitle ones would probably have been pretty well, uh, pretty fine. 
Uh, thanks for flagging that to me. I, I didn't leave the chat open, so I won't be able to see it until uh, the end. I'll, I'll open it up again. Um, okay, uh, uh, back to rockweed. One of the reasons that Lara is studying it is it uh, provides this, basically it's the cool wet blanket, you know, the wet blanket in the good way uh, for things that live underneath. So uh, this is another uh, short video, this one from Porto Cove. So you can see all these dead mussels sort of on the upper right. Uh, but if you move the, the rockweed out of the way, oh, look, mussels underneath, they're okay. Uh, it did not get as hot under, uh, under the seaweed. So we have this situation where, uh, you know, by the end of July, that protective layer has been lost from uh, a lot of the shoreline. And I was really crossing my fingers that we weren't going to get a second heat wave because that would have been, you know, the equivalent of getting a bad sunburn. Um, and then before it heals, getting another bad sunburn. So now you're burning your, sort of the, the lower layers of your skin and the consequences of that second sunburn are a lot worse. Um, the same thing here, the consequences of a second heat wave would have been a lot worse because we would have already lost a lot of the protective um, habitat forming species, including the rock region and, and including the mussels as well. Okay, so how extensive was all of this? Um, here's a bit of a zoomed in uh, map just showing uh, sort of the Sailor Sea and a bit up the central coast. And uh, I, um, I mentioned I'm collaborating with, with a number of folks from Washington, and we have a paper that's now in, uh, we're revising it to, to, to satisfy the reviewer's comments, so I'm hoping that should be uh, accepted pretty soon. Um, I haven't included uh, their data yet uh, until that work is published, but there's a lot of work from um, Hood Canal and Puget Sound and places where, where people are very concerned about shellfish harvesting. Um, uh, uh, but there's also a lot of data on barnacles and mussels. And uh, uh, this paper, is, as our first cut, is, is qualitative. So we're just saying, were things, did they look normal, worse than normal, or a lot worse than normal? And actually, <laughs> we originally had a lot better than normal, better than normal, normal, uh, but nothing was better than normal. So we, we <laughs> trimmed out those two categories. And I've reduced those two emojis. Uh, so the smiley faces are normal. Uh, uh, so the places on the outer coast um, where the tide was earlier in the morning, but also you can see um, this is where there would have been some upwelling and some coastal fog. And even through the Strait of Juan de Fuca um, and in towards um, Blaine, uh, it wasn't excruciatingly hot and uh, the intertidal didn't look that bad. Uh, this little sort of questionable face is Bamfield where it actually depended on wave exposure. So the splashy areas were fine, but the areas that were wave sheltered, there was a lot of uh, mussels that died. Um, but all of these X's, so up in the fjords, you know, Cortez, uh, Campbell River, all through the Strait of Georgia and Hood Canal and Puget Sound, that's where things were really, really unusually bad. And we saw just tremendous losses of, of things like barnacles and mussels, um, but also you know snails and crabs and sand dollars and, and uh, uh, clams and, and oysters and other things. Okay, so how many animals died? Uh, th this was um, featured heavily in the media, um, I think specifically because the number 1 billion was involved. If we had just said a whole lot of animals died, then the CBC would have covered it and the Weather Network would have covered it, which were the two places that the UBC Media Relations Office sent the, the sort of initial little like press release thing. But the reason that it was then covered on CNN and The Guardian and The Washington Post and, and NPR is because a billion is a really, really big number. Uh, so how do we get to a number like that? Well, we do surveys in small areas and then do our best to scale up to uh, larger areas like the Sailor Sea. Um, so with the admitted caveat that there are a number of, of uh, uncertainties when one does this. Um, uh, the, this photo uh, shows what 100 dead barnacles of a particular species look like in my hand. So already you, sh you should get a sense for it. it doesn't take a lot of space to have a lot of death. Um, and this was down at 1,001 steps um, near, near White Rock. And uh, from some random uh, quadrat sampling down there, we know that there were about 50 dead barnacles in each little 10 by 10 centimeter quadrat across this you know, um, long stretch of bouldery shoreline. Um, 
plots that size, we know you can fit 100 of those into a square meter, so you do that multiplication. Um, I'm estimating that the, for every linear meter of shoreline, there's about two square meters of, of barnacle habitat. So I'm saying that the barnacle zone is about two meters wide. Um, that is uh, actually uh, probably an underestimate for a lot of places. Uh, this particular shoreline is more like 20, you know, 15 to 20 meters wide. Um, we do know, though, that there are exactly 1,000 meters in a kilometer, so you multiply that up. There's about 2,500 kilometers of shoreline in the state of Georgia, and I'm going to say roughly 40% of that is good habitat for barnacles. Um, so, uh, you know, again, this is a very approximate number, but when you just do that, you arrive at 10 billion dead barnacles without having gone outside of the Strait of Georgia into Puget Sound or up to the central coast or start to consider, you know, the mussels and the snails and the, you know, uh, and, and then who knows how many of the weird little, you know, amphipods and isopods and, and, and polychaete worms. Um, uh, you're welcome, Sheila, for the mention of the polychaetes. Uh, uh, how many of those things may have died? But I am very comfortable in saying that over a billion animals died and I'm quite comfortable saying that many, many billions of animals died. And we don't know the exact number, but it is staggering. Okay, that's all horrible and depressing. Uh, was there any good news out of this? Uh, not a lot, but if you were a hermit crab, it might not have been that bad. Um, hermit crabs, uh, among other things, all of a sudden had a whole lot new, uh, of new shells to choose from. Uh, so, you know, like, like this situation, um, they're like, oh, this old one that I've got is kind of dinged up and it doesn't fit very well anymore. And, and now, you know, there's all these new new options. Uh, we also know that that hermit crabs have a parasite that seems to not do as well in high temperatures as the hermit crabs themselves do. Uh, so uh, they're, they're, you can actually sort of thermally cure a parasitic infection in some cases. And so they may have benefited a little bit from that. So um, that is one example of a species um, that seems to have done all right. And I'm sure that some hermit crabs were unlucky and died, but, but by and large, they were okay. Uh, anything else? Well, uh, you know, maybe not short-term benefit, but at least short-term not too negatively affected. There's lots of things. Uh, the, the seagrass down there at 1001 Steps um, did fine. There's this cute little orange striped green anemone that did fine. Um, this, this mussel growing on the sides of floating docks did all right. Oysters, fine. Mud snails. I looked really hard at a couple of different places for dead mud snails and didn't find a single dead one. They were all alive. Um, you know, there's some sponges that came through. This is the varnish clam. They survived. These little limpets survived. Um, every single one of these species uh, is not native to British Columbia. Um, uh, this is called the Japanese uh, seagrass for a reason. Uh, the Pacific oyster is also from southern Japan, um, eastern China. You can find them in Hong Kong. Uh, the snails came in with, with oyster culture. The anemones probably did too. These sponges are also from East Asia. Um, uh, uh, so all of this stuff is native or evolved in parts of the world that are just naturally warmer than British Columbia is. And so these species, um, you know, and, and it's not to say that no oysters died. I'll show you that some did, but relative to the natives with which they are competing, they did better. So in the long term, I think we're going to start to see a shift away from, say, you know, mussel beds with our native mussels and towards oyster, um, uh, oyster reefs with a non-native oyster. Uh, and here is that specific comparison. So you've already seen this graph of, you know, basically how far into the sun or into the shade were you uh, uh, as a life and death difference, uh, where the native mussels um, in the sun were, were really not doing well. Uh, we can create the same type of graph for the introduced oysters, and this graph is actually from a different site, but a site that, that got hotter. Um, even so, um, oysters, once you get up to, you know, this is only, what, about a 45 degree angle away from facing the worst place in the sky you could, um, then the oysters were all surviving, and that, that's still a lot of mussels that would have died uh, in that area. Uh, so the oysters are just tolerant of higher temperatures. And I've got a student who's working on, on uh, this sort of native versus invasive comparison right now. And she's uh, doing the, the cold tolerance end at the moment. 
uh, like literally to finishing some of her stuff up today. Um, and then it's going to do the, the high temperature tolerance and um, in the summertime. So we'll have more information on that soon. Um, but you can just see it in some of the photographs in the aftermath. So, you know, our most thermally tolerant things are barnacles. And on this rock, this is just not, not far from my house. So what was it? Butterf Bimby was butterflies in my backyard. This is Bimby barnacles in my backyard. Um, the barnacles on this boulder have died, um, but the oysters have survived. And the, the mussels down here also have died, uh, but the, the oysters are clearly a very thermally tolerant uh, species. All right, is there anything that we can do? Uh, the challenge with, with uh, these types of events is, uh, well, hopefully what they do is they serve as a wake-up call, call to arms, and we uh, become more motivated to act. What I don't want to have happen is for all of us to say, you know what, it's, this has escaped us now, it's beyond our control, uh, I'm giving up. I'm just going to go ahead and go ahead and keep flying private jets and, and uh, you know, eating as much beef as I possibly can and letting my car idle in the driveway. Um, there are things we can do and, and behavioral changes are, are, of course, some of them, but there's some specific and, and my favorite is actually eat your leftovers. Uh, the less food we can waste, um, uh, the, 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 the less food we need to grow and transport. And, and so that's a win. So if someone uh, says, what are you doing for lunch? You can say, I'm fighting climate change for lunch because I'm eating my leftovers from dinner last night. Um, this shows uh, Amelia's ex experiment, um, but uh, actually it, it shows a previous iteration of Amelia's experiment, which was done by another student named uh, Becca Cordes, who I have a picture of here. Um, and this particular one also included a manipulation of limpets, which are the, the little uh, grazers, the, the, the sheep of the intertidal zone. And um, she discovered something really, really interesting, which is if you keep the grazers around and she's got her you know, black warmer tiles compared to her white cooler tiles, um, the system is much more robust in the face of, of warming when you have the grazers present. I don't remember, did I include a graph of that? Hopefully not, it's a, a, a really esoteric. But the result is cool, right? If you can um, maintain diversity in the system, um, then you are building a more robust ecosystem that does better in the face of something like a heat wave. And although heat waves are going to become more frequent and more severe, and that is a global problem, which we as individuals have little control over, um, local conservation is something that we can manage at you know, the scale of a municipality uh, or you know, of a province and who we're voting for in a sort of on, 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 on more local scales. Uh, all right, so what are the long-term prospects for the BC coast? Uh, and, and I'll sort of preface this to say that uh, we're working hard to figure this out and uh, we'll be doing a lot of field work this summer that follows up on some of the things that we observed last summer to look at rates of recovery. But uh, to just go ahead and be bold and lay down some expectations uh, ahead of actually seeing any results, I think that the mussels and the barnacles are probably going to be fine. They are really abundant, even after you've lost a lot of them, and they make just scads of babies every year, uh, and they grow fast, uh, so, uh, and, and they disperse really well. So, you know, all those, you know, billions of larvae are just going to, you know, swim around, spread around the Strait of Georgia, recolonize the areas from which they've been lost. So, possibly by as soon as next winter, so after a full recruitment season and some growth has happened, um, the shores in uh, places like Lighthouse Park might look pretty similar, or at least after, you know, maybe two or three years, give it, give it a little bit of time, and I think that'll be okay for those species that, that live fast and disperse far. But not everything has that lifestyle. You know, some clams live for decades, gooey ducks live for over a century. Um, so those are going to take longer, uh, just because their population cycles are slower. And not everything disperses like a barnacle, where, you know, which floats around or swims around for 30 days. Um, seaweeds, the, the rock weeds, um, you know, occasionally the whole frond will, will break off and float around, and that's a great way to get further. But the, if, if you're still attached to the rock, <laughs> the dispersal of those things is about half a meter. So not very impressive. So Lara Calvo's shoreline, which has been denuded, I'm super curious to see how long that takes to recover. Um, and then there's all of the little, you know, 
worms and amphipods and everything that lives in and amongst the barnacles and mussels and seaweeds, where we just don't know. Like, not only do we not know uh, what their tolerance to high temperatures is, we don't know a lot about their biology. We don't know a lot about how many there used to be, how many there are now, because uh, very few people have the patience to go out and, and count those. Uh, but I can say with a, a fair amount of confidence that uh, not only will we have more frequent and more se severe heat waves, but when we do, we're going to see the ecosystem shift. And it's going to be away from some of the cold water species that are native, uh, like these mussels in this photo, and towards uh, warm water species which are not native, like the, like the Pacific oyster uh, and, and many of its friends, which came in with it for aquaculture or accidentally came in with it. Okay, so what have we learned uh, through all of this? Um, several things, actually. Uh, first, uh, species that were unlikely to suffer mass heat kills in the past sure can experience them now. Um, I did not think that I would see this type of event before, I don't know, 2050. Uh, so the fact that it's happening now uh, is very troubling. Uh, and it really, it, you know, a lot of people asked uh, uh, me and my students right after this is like, you know, well, uh, were you ready for this? And what are you doing now? It's like, we are completely scrambling because this was not something we envisioned as a possibility. So we didn't even have, you know, it didn't occur to us to, to get the data that we would want for comparison before, because we just didn't, you know, like the first day of the heat wave, um, I didn't go down to the shore. And then the second day I went down out of curiosity and then realized, oh man, it smells really bad. I need to bring some equipment. And then the third day, the equipment I brought, I couldn't use to measure the body temperature of live mussels because all the mussels had died. Uh, so yes, we learned a lot about uh, what we might need to expect in the, in the, in the near future not, and in the now, not in the distant future. Uh, we know that the severity of, of the heat wave is not the same everywhere and where you live matters. So if you were in Tofino, you were probably not very badly affected. But if you were in Campbell River or in uh, uh, um, North Vancouver, uh, you probably were. Um, the temperature that you experience during heat wave varies on very local scale. So if it, you know, just a big boulder on the shore, um, if you looked at that from the north side, it might look, you know, relatively unscathed. But if you look at it on the south or the west side, it looks like a catastrophe. Um, very often, uh, I would say, more, not just sometimes, you depend on other species to stay cool. So the, the rockweeds and the mussels and even the barnacles are providing these sort of moist and, and, and cooler microhabitats for other things. Um, we are going to see a substantial reshuffling of where species live in the near future. You know, things aren't going to be able to live as high up on the shore or on some of these south facing shorelines or, you know, in Campbell River compared to uh, somewhere on the outer coast. Um, and, and all of this uh, has really striking parallels with the way people experience heat waves. So, um, you know, we're not barnacles. I don't want to uh, insult barnacles by saying we are. Uh, but, you know, people, populations that didn't used to suffer math, uh, you know, mass casualty events during heat waves now can. You know, uh, uh, hundreds of people in British Columbia died during the heat wave. That is unlikely to have happened 50 years or more ago. Uh, the severity is not the same everywhere. Um, you know, if, if you live in India, you're much more vulnerable to this than if you live in Sweden. Um, and that variation happens on very local scales, too. There's a, a, a sobering study from my hometown of Baltimore. Uh, there are hot neighborhoods and there are cool neighborhoods. And guess what? The cool neighborhoods are the wealthy neighborhoods, the white neighborhoods where there's more trees and the hot neighborhoods have fewer trees, tend to be more ethnically diverse and tend to be less affluent. Um, but the tree cover is really important. So just like fucus on the shore, trees in our neighborhoods helps to keep us cool. And we're seeing people moving around the planet in response to this too. Uh, in, within Australia, Tasmania is becoming more and more popular because it doesn't get as hot as Sydney or Adelaide does. All right, so um, with, with those comparisons, I think I will uh, stop there and hopefully have left plenty of time for questions. And uh, I will stop the share, but I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to return to a slide if someone would like to see it again. But if I stop the share, I can at least see your faces and uh, also check the chat. So thank you very much. <laughs>